Doug, welcome back to the Way of Champions podcast. It's been a while. Yeah, it's good to be back. Thanks for thanks for having me. Holy cow, man. Um, I'm excited to have you because your new book, The Coach's Guide to Teaching, is incredible. I've taken so much out of it. Uh, it it's so good. I remember when I first got the copy and I looked at it and I'm like, why are the margins of this book so big? And then I realized it's to take notes and <laughs> mine is filled with notes and uh, so, so good. So what, what made you kind of go after all these years of really, you'd been working in the coaching world, but really yeah. known for your work with teachers, what made you write the teaching book for coaches? Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking. Maybe two, one is questions, you know, just coaches asking questions really smart questions and my feeling like I needed to be able to answer them for them. And then realizing that in many cases, the answers were, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so had to figure it out. And I think that one of the really interesting times about being an educator, classroom educator or coaching educator right now is how much cognitive science is, 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 or should be changing the way that we think about the learning process. Mm -hmm. And often how slow that is, certainly in the in the K-12 sector, but also I think at the coaching sector sometimes to filter into daily practice. And so um, I started, I, I was, didn't really know that I was writing a book. I just started reading a lot of cognitive science to try and answer questions that coaches asked. And then I just got really, really fascinated by it. And I think that for me, like the writing process ultimately comes out of I write, I write the books to understand what I think and to, and to, and to hammer into words, the ideas that I'm wrestling with. And they were just really important. You know, I have, I have three kids of my own who are athletes and, um, and I care a lot about, uh, about the game and the development that the opportunity that it gives to develop kids. And, and, and I appreciate coaches and all that they do for young people in their lives. So mm-hmm. I guess I just started struggling <laughs> you know i think you never really know that you're writing a book when you start writing a book and then suddenly you're doing it yeah no it's it's crazy and my, my, you know it's funny because uh this is my 10th year of changing the game project and so much of changing the game project is things that i would come across whether it was cognitive science or psychology or skill acquisition session design whatever that i kept saying like why isn't this why wasn't this in my coaching course, right? Yeah. Why didn't I learn this 15 years ago? This would have been really helpful to know. And and certainly like my last book, Every Moment Matters, touches on some of the areas that in your book here, you go much deeper in to how people learn and how we should design for, for optimal and effective learning in that. But yeah, I, I go through this stuff and I'm like, man, like if we got this to more coaches, sport would be so much better, wouldn't it? I mean, I hope so. That's the, like, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the dream, right? We just wasted our time, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the craft of making who want, like it's the craft of making better, but who wants, to, who wants to do it and not feel like they've won at the end that they've served people well and they've helped them to develop. So, yeah, I mean, maybe that's, that would have been a better answer to like or the shorter answer to why did you write the book, which is I love the idea of helping people get better at making people. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Now um, just, you know, in case someone's new to this, uh, what I also liked A, because I'm a soccer coach, but that's kind of your sport as well. So you Mm -hmm. wrote a lot of this around how would you do this in soccer, but it's really applicable, certainly to any invasion sport with your tactical tweaks. Um, But really, it's applicable to, I think, most every sport, uh, at least most of it is, right? That was definitely my intention. I mean, my goal was to write about about the challenge of, of teaching and learn the challenges of teaching and learning in sport, especially as you pointed out in invasion sports. But I also wanted to, I wanted to be realistic. You know, I just think, I think it's important to be hum, to be, to recognize what you don't know. And I don't know basketball enough to talk credibly about it, or even to understand the challenges of basketball mm-hmm. coaches face much better. I think to write about the thing that I know and then let other sports coaches see the analogies and make the connections than to try and pretend that like, I know something about, you know, how you would teach defense in mm-hmm. hockey, rugby, basketball, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was, a lot of it was about, you know, um, just knowing the limits of my own, of my own knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because I think 
I think most good coaches, if they have the opportunity, go watch other sports. I remember yeah. being a young soccer coach at University of Vermont, and I used to love to go watch ice hockey practice, right? And be like, okay, like, because there's, I love transition games and flowing games, and hockey is nothing is if it's not 3v2s and 2v1s and back and forth. And I used to watch that and be like, how, how can I adapt that into there? Because those guys are having fun. I know yeah. my kids would have fun with that too, right? So, yeah. Well, it's, it's fascinating because sometimes you can see it better outside your own domain. Like yeah. a couple of quick stories. Like I think that, you know, you sometimes you're so vested in the content and the specifics of your own sport. I remember um, working at a, 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 a workshop for coaches who ran licensing license courses for U.S. soccer. And the workshop was on feedback. And I had video of this soccer coach who I thought gave beautiful feedback. He just, he was so supportive but clear on what the action step was and precise. And he had, he just, you know, can talk more about it. I, th I thought his feedback mm -hmm. was outstanding. And I showed the video to this group of coaches and there's practically a riot in the room because um, the first coach who commented said, he's doing a drill on, he's doing an exercise on overlapping, on teaching your outside backs to make overlapping runs and he's doing it in the back half of the field. Uh -huh. And I said, okay, you're right. If you do an exercise like this, do it in the front half of the field. What do you think about his feedback? But they, we couldn't get them I mean, for 15 minutes. All we could talk about was the unforgivable sin. And, and they were right, like, so I will assume that the coaches were right about the way that this drill should be run, but yeah, they couldn't get beyond it to see what was there. And, and, and just one more time, like the first time I did a workshop for, for, the, for the pro license workshop for US, uh, for US Soccer Federation, I'd been spending years trying to gather a video of great coaches in action. And, you know, the problem with showing a video of any coach anywhere is that coaches are like, oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah. And so I decided that I would, I tear, I tear, with terror, decided that I was going to show them math, you know, footage of, footage of math classrooms. And, and, and I was worried that coaches would not be able to extrapolate. Right. But ironically, this is sort of where the book begins. Like they instantly saw their own work in a, in a, K-12 key teachers' classrooms and the analogies and the applications. And in some ways, I think we're able to see them more yeah. because they were free from like, I'm not trying to evaluate whether like that kid has good touch and whether you should be doing the drill in the front half of the field, the back half of the field. All I can look, all I'm looking at here <laughs> is the teaching moves. Yeah. And it's great. It's great, right? Because it sort of, it takes takes the ego out of the room of like, oh, yeah. well, I, I I can teach better than that. And and it um, gets down to, okay, teaching. And, and this is really like the, the gist of everything is if we are teachers, right. Which I think most coaches agree that that's our job is to impart knowledge. If, if that's what teaching is, then, then, um, shouldn't we learn the basic principles of, you know, how to deliver information effectively and also how do the people in front of us learn best? Yeah. And, and, and that's what I, I love about the book. Um, so, I mean, I really think that those of us in coaching have so much to learn from teachers. And this is why I was so glad, you know, when you and I first met, you were, I think you were just starting some of the workshops for U.S. soccer and the coaching licenses. And I was like, this is great. And so many of my friends would come back like, you hear this guy, Doug, like, wow, he blew my mind out there, you know? And, uh, you know, so it was great. Like the feedback you were getting because it was so far from the norm. It was so important. Yeah. It's interesting too. I, would, I mean, I'm really happy to, to hear that. And thank you for saying it. It's also been fascinating to realize how much coaches also know that is useful to teachers. Mm. I mean, you know, like at first when I started doing the work with coaches, I would kind of hide it from people in my day job. You know, my day job is trying to like <laughs> improve you the education system for like, kids. Don't who tell are anyone. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like, like my day job is working, like trying to improve schools for kids who are cut off from opportunity and who, you know, who like, and their lives are on the line because they're consigned to terrible schools. And so then I would go do workshops for soccer coaches and I would feel a little bit guilty about it. And I would come back to the office and I wouldn't tell anyone about it. But very, very quickly, like this book and the process of writing this book, it would not stay in its lane. And, you know, like the first chapter is about the power of perception and the importance of perception and decision making. And I couldn't, I would go back to my office and watch videotape of teachers and, and be thinking about A, how is this teacher making decisions about what they perceive? B, how is a instructional, how is a principal or an instructional leader making decisions based on what they perceive this teacher to be doing? C, what are students perceiving and what the teacher is doing? Like perception is, is everywhere. And I really, you know, I think that's something that coaches actually have 
will have quite profound thoughts on that are also applicable in the in the teaching sector. So um, yeah. I'm happy to hear that the, the teaching books are useful to coaches, but I think it actually runs both ways. In a really, yeah. In a really well, way. well, again, I mean, I had you way back when you generously sent sent me, you know, teach like a champion. I think it was second edition maybe at that time or whatever. And, and I was just, you know, how, what a great book this was. And I, I, I think I always secretly at that point was like, I hope he just writes a book for coaches that turns this because I'd read practice perfect and, and that kind of, you know, got into the sporting realm. And so when I, you know, when this, when I first, I think I came across this on LinkedIn, I'm like, Oh yes, he did it. Awesome. I was so excited. Like I get a couple of books, like, Whenever Dan Koa writes a new book, I'm like, all right, David Epstein. I'm like, all right. And, and yours have been so impactful for me. So uh, it, it was great. So let's like start unpacking this sure. book. Um, um, maybe like decision-making since you kind of start the book um, mm. with that, like what is a common misunderstanding about decision-making? Um, if, if I think we can all agree that invasion games for certain are a series of like see and choose and decide and execute and assess your choice and do it again and again and again. I think some of the things that maybe people that I, that I, I came to understand in writing the book and that are the theme of this chapter are one that um, decision-making is not a transferable skill. Mm -hmm. In other words, across you, you, sports necessarily or, or settings or that you settings, can't, that yeah, you yeah. can't, there, there, I mean, people want so desperately to believe in this beautiful dream that there is something called higher order thinking that I can teach kids, I can teach people. And if they can do it, they will be able to apply it in any setting. Mm. And I think the cognitive science is overwhelmingly clear that that problem solving and higher order thinking and even creativity are domain specific, mm -hmm. which is they're based on your background knowledge. And so one of the first things I'd have to think about is so what you know determines or influences deeply what you see. You are watching Man United, Man City with your son. And not only are you rooting for opposite teams, <laughs> but you're watching, you know, let's assume that you know a little bit more about the game than him. And you're, you know, you're, you're actually, you're watching a different, you're watching a different game and you're perceiving different things. And so one is that what you, what you see, what you learn from what you see is knowledge dependent. And so the more we can infuse athletes with background knowledge, the more that they will learn from the perceptive environment. And then I think the second thing is, is understanding the role of working memory mm -hmm. and its limitations. One of the challenging things about a sports setting is that you oftentimes have to make decisions that happen faster than working memory can function. And the, you know, the example I give of this in the book is actually a pitch baseball in the major leagues it arrives at, you know, fastball arrives at home plate in four tenths of a second. And it turns out, speaking of things that cognitive science has learned that it takes your brain six tenths of a second to have a conscious thought. Mm -hmm. So how do they do it? <laughs> how do they, like, so, and for years, fascinatingly, people thought like the key to hitting is bat speed mm -hmm. and they would do like reflex and bat or, speed or reaction drill. time. Yeah. 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 Yes. React reaction time. Right. And it yeah. turns out that it, that, um, you know, they, they tested Albert Pujols at the point where he was like the, best hitter in the major leagues and his react his his reaction time was average for the adult male population yeah so what is it and it turns out that it's it's the it's it's perception which is while the pitcher is getting ready to deliver the pitch he is reading angle of arm motion you know hip, uh, hip rotation wrist and shoulder angle aren't what they now call arm channel mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is that so and, and that tells him what the pitch is going to be and then he links his perception to an action and it bypasses the conscious, you know, the site of conscious thinking, which is working memory. And the same thing happens in a soccer game all the time, right? You make a pass faster than you, you make a pass faster than you can think. And there, you reckon, and you think to yourself, how did I know to make that pass? Wow, I can't believe I just made that pass. And that is your conscious mind catching up with your unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And so this is like, this is, we have to train people to, do this sort of decision-making and what it means is training people's eyes to look at the, you know, what's the signal that tells me what's likely to happen and can I learn to read it? Can I, you know, how do I make sure that my athletes spend a lot of time in environments that give them lots of exposure to the right, right cues? And how do I, and can I socialize them to learn to look for things that are important cues? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I suggest is that rather than asking what should you do, Mm -hmm. asking what should you look for? What should you see? What do you see? 
is that may actually be more productive for athletes. And this, the last thing I would say about this whole process is to go back to like what a major league hitter does, which is they're watching, you know, the hips, the shoulder and the, the elbow and the wrist of the pitcher. For the most part, they have no idea that they do this. 90% of what we do visually is unconscious to us. Mm. And therefore, you know, what made Albert Pujols great? Who taught him to look that way at the pitcher and to understand, you know, hip, elbow, wrist. Mm-hmm. He, he doesn't even know he's doing it, never mind where it came to him. And so mm-hmm. there's a sort of blind spot of opportunity for us to begin training athletes' eyes so that they can learn to read faster and better on the field. It, it makes me think of, of two things, right? Number one, um, a, a great the great video – uh, of Cristiano Ronaldo uh, finishing crosses in the dark, yeah. right? And and they shut off the lights right before a guy's hitting the ball, and, and he still scores it, right? Versus an amateur, I think they called him Ronald, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was Ronaldo right. versus right. Ronald, and 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 it's just an amazing thing, right? Because of all these repetitions of that, and then I also think that's what's so important. We're learning a lot more of is that you know you hear coaches. Um, especially in soccer, you know, they're running unopposed activities, check to the ball and, and, and look over your shoulder, check your shoulder or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but the act of turning your head is not anything. It's what can you, what do you see in that moment? And then how are you able to react to that? Um, and so this is a really interesting thing that has influenced the way that I coach as well is like, you know, telling a kid just to turn his head for the sake of turning a head is like, what did you see is really the thing. And what does that tell you of what you should do with this ball? Are you laying it off one touch? Are you turning? Um, do you know that your strikers, dri- you know, there's a space to play your striker in. And so if you set it back, the ball's going through. Um, and th- we're learning a lot about this too. This is not, you know, but, yeah. but like the, you know, the, we know that the best, soccer players in the world, right. When measured on this Javi, Iniesta, I think, uh, Steven Gerrard, Frank Lampard, like they were the best, the most scans per, per minute of any players in the world, but it's not just scanning. It's what am I, you know, what is the information telling me? Right. Do they see because they scan or do they scan because they see? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You could, you could tell players to scan, 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 and they could look over their shoulder, but and I, I think it's worth doing. We do want to sort of get them in the habit of, of putting themselves in a position to look, but then that does not guarantee me that they're actually looking or looking mm-hmm. at the right things. And I see this all, I think this is a common, commonly in, in, in trainings, you would see a coach trying to help players make a decision by inserting what I would describe as an artificial cue. Like I hold up one finger or two fingers for whether you should like turn or play back. Mm-hmm. Or I say, you know, um, blue or red, depending on which, but, and we think that we're teaching decision-making, but we're not actually, because I'm not, I'm not teaching you to understand the cue that would actually cause you to make the decision in the brain. And I think the research is pretty clear here that that, that is not going to transfer that if I want to, if I want to have the player learn to make the decision about whether to turn or go back, it would be much better to like have another player either be on their back shoulder or stand away from them and have something that sort of simulates as close as I can get to the actual visual cue that they'd see. Yeah. In the game. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And I, I even think that there is a physiological part to this as well of how well do your eyes track, right? Yeah. Like, you know, cause some people's eyes, I have a, a friend who um, is a performance coach and he teaches some of this and he's done some stuff with my kids and he's, you know, I'm watching him work and you see their eyes don't track you know, gradually yeah. they kind of, they jerk. And it's like, if your eyes jerk, you, you, you miss something. Right. And, and so he's like, you know, you can train their eyes to track more smoothly, which will let them take in more information, which is super interesting. Yeah, I think Clive Woodward, who is the, um, the national the coach of England's national rugby team, mm-hmm. sort of the first coach that I'm aware of to do this. He actually had his play, he had an expert on, on visual tracking come in and train his players and they did eye just strengthening and Mm -hmm. and movement exercises and this was like this is one of his key things that he did the year before they won the world cup for the first time Mm -hmm. um and now they're you know this is a whole field yeah yeah. but interestingly like i I read you know i read a couple of 
papers and interviews by people who do this kind of work. And one of the fascinating things that they, they talked about was cell phones mm -hmm. and how spending time on a cell phone, especially the day of the game, um, restricts your eye movement. Uh, and that it narrows well, your field of vision. It narrows right? your field of focus and sort of socialize. It's, it's the, like the opposite of stretching. <laughs> it's <laughs> narrowing. And so like one really small thing you could, you could do to help your players see better on game day, at least as one expert suggests is get kids off phones, mm -hmm. so, you know, like, and, and which is ironic because so often like we're on a bus, we're in a car, we're driving to a game and kids spend four hours on their phones, yeah. right? And then they get out and they, and their eyes aren't ready. And if they're on a phone, then, you know, what's your warm up that's stretching their eyes too, yeah, right. is, is interesting. Um, which is fascinating because the answer to that question would be, I have no idea. <laughs> which yeah, I just exactly. think in a lot of cases, like I think, you know, like a lot of this book is about, here's what the data says, here's some, here's what the science says, here's some conjecture and the rest of it is, I don't know. And I hope the coaches will tell me when they figure it out. Well, I'll tell you this. My daughter did a one and a half hour session with this coach um, on eye movement, strengthening her eyes, getting her to, to look at stuff. Um, and then on sort of her balance and receiving some balls after. And, she, and so she did really minimal physical work. And at the end of it, she said, dad, I have never been so tired in my out. life. Right now. She took a nap. She went yeah. and took a nap and she's like, you know, I'll go do a double practice. No problem. And she was like, I am exhausted right now. Yeah. Just shattered. So it, it's a fascinating field. Uh, the, the other thing I want to ask you about that, which I think is a really, which ties this together is the idea of decision-making versus problem solving. Yeah. Because one's a, working memory and one's a long-term memory. So maybe just make that de decision and, 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 or that distinction because yeah. soccer is a decision-making game. Yeah. We often use those terms interchangeably decision-making problem solving, mm -hmm. uh, making a little bit of an arbitrary distinction here, but I would say decision-making is, is fast mm -hmm. and it usually skips your, and in the game of soccer at least skips your working memory, your kind mm -hmm. of sight of your conscious thinking. And problem solving is a slow process. It's much more deliberate. It can be wiser. It can it can re it can reconsider things, but for the most part, it's too slow mm -hmm. to work in in games. But it's actually still deeply important because you, because it's one of the things that encodes the knowledge. Your working memory is what encodes knowledge in long term memory, mm -hmm. and and long term memory is what is influencing your decisions when you're when you're working fast. And so I want to make sure that I'm. I'm building an, an, an engaging and attentive mental environment for players during training, because that's the time when I want to think about problem solving. Kind of to what you were saying about your, your daughter, which is a good training session should be like, I should be thinking about the degree to which players are working hard mentally as much as they are hustling physically. Mm -hmm which is much easier to look for and therefore much easier to manage. Mm -hmm. But that's where I really encode players background knowledge. Mm -hmm. So problem solving, slow process, um, prepares players to be decision makers, which is fast process that happens oftentimes what we call instinct or soccer IQ without, um, without the work of, without, without working memory during a match. But then I think there's also this aspect of, of group invasion games where, you know, like people, one of the differences between sport and the classroom Mm -hmm. Is that in the classroom, I'm trying to teach one, one student to make decision making or solve math problems. But in soccer, I'm trying to get 11 players to coordinate their decision making and predict what other players will do. And that it's almost like it. It's like a neural network or you know, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's that flock of, of sparrows, right, that are swallows yeah. or whatever that all move in unison. Like, how does that have that's what you need. The problem solving is the outcome of, of decision making among of predictable or legible, transparent decision making among a group of people. How do you coach that? How do you teach it? How do you socialize people to be able to read one another and predict their moves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah, and it's crazy, and that's why it takes so long. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right, why so and why you have to start early. Which I think is what like, if there's one thing I would say about that chapter is where to start is, it is so early to let kids win games for you. Yeah, as a coach because they're athletic outliers and let them persist in playing a certain way that in the end is destructive to them because they won't be able to play that way in three or four or five years. And it's not just that they won't be able to play that way. It's that they have to start now preparing for a more challenging decision-making environment and 
if the whole team isn't playing in a, in a strong decision-making environment that predicts where the game is going, they will all suffer, right? The kid who's, kids will stop making smart runs off the ball if they never get the ball mm-hmm. as a result of the smart run. And so you have to start making these changes to build perception and decision making and have have decision making be logical according to the game and based on the based on based on knowledge and understanding in the game model you have to start making those moves before before the game tells you that before before results in the game tell you that you have to yeah. because once the results start telling you you have to you have to start building decision making more it's probably too late because yeah. the process takes so long yeah and and this is the argument argument the discussion you know we have a mutual friend in, in Todd Bean at, at Tovo and I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in Todd and I love his understanding of both the game and coaching and education and how people learn and he's got the both those two backgrounds that he's tied together and you quote Todd in your book but this is why you know I, I think in the United States especially we thought that we could you know spend years teaching technical touches and then we could layer in the decision making when they're 12 right and 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 they're gone they're they're already eight years behind um because it's, if you think about the game right 98 percent of the time you don't have the ball and all of a sudden if all you're doing is training the two percent of time you have the ball you just missed out all those yeah right uh it's not a faucet that you can turn on at age 12 decision making <laughs> great now now i want you to start making smart decisions like yeah. smart decisions are based on what you learned all those years and if you're right. looking down at your feet and you're thinking about um is my ankle locked your or yeah I mean, I mean you have to you have to learn to keep your ankle fixed yeah. but you have you know but you if you're um but then you stop thinking about that right and you're now your working memory is yeah, exactly. for Where's the space? Where's the ball? Where's my opponents? Where's my teammates, right? That's where your working memory's going. If I'm thinking, how, can, how soon can I take my 12th touch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, do I get to my, how do I get to my 12th touch? Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's interesting. And this fits into this idea that I've been, I just taught um, something on it for a PE conference, right? The difference between performance and learning. Yeah. Right. And and so maybe break down that distinction, because I think this is one that a lot of coaches don't get and athletes don't get. And it's one of the most important things that we can understand and, and do correctly. Yeah, great. So now we're kind of getting into chapter two, which is about the profound, the most overlooked factor in learning is forgetting. Mm hmm. Um, it's a constant and, a, and it's a ruthless enemy. And so the difference between performance and learning is that performance is what players can do or an athlete can do at the end of a training session. And we equate that with what they know. And so we see kids do something at the end of the training session on Tuesday and everything looks ship shape. We're like, great, it's going to happen. And then it doesn't show up on Saturday and we wonder why. And sometimes we get mad at kids. Guys, we talked about pressing all week. Where's my pressing? He worked on this in practice. His <laughs> right, famous right. last words for a coach, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so there, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why things don't transfer to the game, but one of the biggest ones is that we have not accounted for forgetting, which is the second kids walk off the field, they begin forgetting what they learned. And half, you know, an hour later, they remember some fraction of it, possibly, you know, as much as like 60% of it. And the next day they remember uh, the memory is a ghost. Mm-hmm. And this happens to everyone. I think, the, I think the first sentence in that chapter is you have forgotten almost everything you've learned in your life, which is true. And, and, like, and that I read in chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and so we have, so the difference between performance and learning is that, is that um, learning accounts for the, whether we've learned something is accounts for whether we've forgotten it. Mm-hmm. And the problem with we get a false positive at the end of end of a training session that tells us that players know how to do something and we're not accounting for the fact that they have begun to forget it. And so unless we build the training environment to cause players to constantly retrieve into their working memory, the things that they are in the process of learning, they will forget. You know, we, we, we can affect the rate and the degree to which people forget things, but only through, through conscious action. And for the most part, it's not something that coaches or many educators think about intentionally enough. Mm-hmm. You know, like one of the takeaways for me in writing this book is that in order to encode something in long-term memory, which is where it has to be for a player to use it in, in the game, I have to learn it, 
mm-hmm. begin to forget it and then practice it again, retreat into memory, and then mm-hmm. learn to forget it and practice it again, and then learn to forget it and practice it again. And so that has to happen over a span of time. Mm-hmm. And so there is almost nothing that even a perfect session could install in players' long-term memory such that they will remember it, you know, weeks or months from now mm-hmm. in a single session, right? Mm-hmm. I have to have to have things repeat across sessions. Yeah, it's, and, it's, yeah. especially something complicated. Like you might right. teach a corner kick, sure. right? Or a free kick, but not something is as, you know, you know, pressing, you know, you know, or 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 movement within a, a high you know a high press or or whatever like right. n- nothing that long, nothing that complicated with so many dynamic parts will ever be learned in a day. That ask players to understand a role or to, you know to uh, that involves some some aspect of thinking. It will never be learned in a day. Exactly right. right. And and, so. and then and then the other thing that you talk about there, which is really important, is so what's that amount of time? that you allow someone to forget. And that really depends on the level of the learner. Yeah, it depends on the level of, I mean, it depends on a a bunch of factors, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably different for everything. Mm -hmm. The rule of thumb is the best time to remember something is when you've begun to forget it. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of factors you have to think about in that. Like like, uh, the learner, the learner's degree of attention and concentration, the complexity of the task, you know, their their emotional state, all those things affect the, and you know, in, in the in the book, I present something called a forgetting curve, which maps the rate at which memories, knowledge and memory degrade. Yeah. But it's a guess. It's you know, it's a different curve for everything, and so it's a it's a it's a it's a hypothetical curve, and it's still a useful curve. But um, there's a lot of figuring out, you know, like how many times they have to repeat it, and you know, how far apart to make sure that. Yeah, I know it, but I do think that like the result of this is that kids are on a treadmill, right? They're they're constantly learning things but not mastering them. Mm-hmm. So we're back to like, okay, we have to explain this again. We have to explain this again. And interestingly, you know, I, I think it's true that there's almost nothing you can master in a single session. And I think that that the un, the unit of planning that many coaches use is a week, right? Mm-hmm. We plan a week of training because we're playing. On X Saturday, team. yeah, We're yeah. Playing on Saturday, so I'm pre- I'm prepping for my game on Saturday, and what that suggests is that the more that planning, game oriented planning, affects what I do in training, the more I'm using a short term horizon as opposed to a long term horizon, mm-hmm. the less likely players are to encode things in long term memory and remember them six, eight, ten months from now. And so, inter- you know, the more, in some ways, you could argue, the more competitive in the environment, mm-hmm. the more the game, the more we perceive the games to matter the more elite the players, the more likely as they get older, they are to get on this treadmill of like, of, of never mastering things at exactly the time when they should be, when they are you know, on, yeah. on, the, on the, the point of inflection of becoming great or not. Actually, sometimes in many cases, I think we know these players, their learning slows down mm-hmm. and it's possible that it's because they're, the competitive environment is distracting us from the things that cause long-term development. Yeah, you know, the, the, the 18 year old pro who jumps from the youth team into the first team and all of a sudden is in constant game preparation mode, right? You're either in recovery preparation, play recovery preparation. And, and all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, you know, he was doing great. And then he stopped learning. And U17 like, national team never heard from again. Right. Like yeah. there are a lot of players like, you know, I, I think I tell the story in chapter six of like how many, how many players on the youth national team, you know, they're the, the 18, 17, 18 year old kid who gets called up to the first team. They're playing with the first team there and we assume that they're going to be great. And then, you know, yeah, it never I, want, I want to save that part for the end, but yeah. that's a great story. So we're just going to, we're going to tease everyone with that right now, but yeah. it's such a great, great discussion point as well. And so, and so I think, right. That these are the things, right. That a, a great learning environment, how you design for effective learning, right. It has this, spacing it has interleaving um that has it, it, it mimics the match um so you know you you use this fr- phrase as well you know to get back to sort of we plan one week at a time sort of yearly mastery points and i've been helping in the local club here that i coach in like okay what what is our model what are our principles of play what are the things that we need kids who are 11 to learn over the course of a year Right. Yeah. The, and, and they're, they're going to be simple, not a lot of them, but 
you know, the, the, the 20% of concepts that make 80% of the difference, right? And then how do we weave these into training so that we cover it, they start forgetting it, we cover it again, they start forgetting it, we cover it again, and then maybe we test to see if they actually know it or not. Yeah. I'm just thinking about information architecture within a club, and I think mm -hmm. that there are four documents for items that a club needs to build background knowledge to support decision making and and deep player understanding and the first one is probably a curriculum which i think is like here's you know an overall view of here's what we're going to learn this year and each year in the course of our club mm -hmm. um because you know you think about the average u14 coach who's um who uh you know, wants to build, it assumes that his players know something about pressing, mm -hmm. but actually they don't, like, <laughs> or he doesn't even know what the players know because they've all been in different, you know, they've all played for different coaches who, and he doesn't even know what the previous right. You coach yell goal side coach. and they run to five yeah, different. They have places. no idea what you're talking about. Right? <laughs> yeah. or, or half the kids know and half the kids don't. Yeah. 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 Right. So it's important to articulate, like, what are the things that we need to master by what point in these clubs so that we can talk about them and refer to them and build off of them. And I, th I think, you know, a lot of clubs have a curriculum. For the most part, it lives in some dusty drawer somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is, how do you get the curriculum into life in the club? And so I think the second document that you need, like a curriculum is club facing, right? It's written for my, me, my technical, for my technical director and my coaches to talk about and design, like, what are our priorities and when do things need to be mastered by? Then I think there's a game model, which may be a young, among younger players, I call principles of play, which, and this is a player facing document that describes the things that we're seeking to do when we're playing. Uh, you know, we want to play the ball away, we want to play away from pressure. We want to be narrow on defense and what, you know, with the younger kids, narrow on defense and wide on, on offense. Maybe with older players, it's our game. There might be multiple game models when mm -hmm. we're pressing, you know, when we're, when we're in a low block, these are the things that we're trying to accomplish. And I want players to have this in their long-term memory so that, that, you know, one of the, we were talking earlier about coordinated decision-making across players. Mm -hmm. One of the ways to accomplish that is that, they understand mutually what they're trying to do. And it's in long-term memory. It's instinctive for them. When we get the ball in the situation, here's where we want, here, generally here's where we want it to go. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there's no room for creativity, but understanding the primary goal or the principle or the, or the you know, the default mm -hmm. um, is powerful. Mm -hmm. And then this, you know, and I think like you think about like even the term playing between the lines, which might be something that would be in a game model. Mm -hmm. How many players on when coaches talk about getting in between the lines or breaking lines, how many players really know what that means and can mm -hmm. visualize it in a way that they could operationalize? I suspect it's far, it's a far lower number than mm -hmm. most coaches think. Yeah. And we have and maybe, that curse yeah. of knowledge, right? As the coach, like we know exactly. exactly what that looks like. And I can look at this scenario and be like, if I want to break the lines, that's where I'd go. And, and, and we yeah. see it and we assume that players see it too. Yeah. So then I think, I think that, and that maybe gets me to the third thing that I think is maybe the, the most powerful of these is a set of shared vocabulary, mm -hmm. right? The words are, um, words create ideas for us, create concepts. It's hard to have a concept that you don't have a word for. Mm -hmm. And so the words that we use to describe our environment should be consistent and intentional in a club. You talk, you know, you, if we're going to talk about receiving a ball, this might not be the best example, but like you could research re receiving the ball side on and receiving the ball on the half turn are roughly mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. If, if I have a coach one year who talks about receiving on the half turn and mm -hmm. another coach who talk the next year who talks about receiving the ball side on, I have a bunch of players who are not, who may never put together that those mm -hmm. two experiences are the same thing and, and perceive them the same way. Certainly like with, you know, with more tactical things, mm -hmm. having consistent vocabulary, consistent words that we use to describe the experience of the game of soccer, having a vocabulary list for the words that we all should know allows us to talk about the game in a reliable, consistent mm -hmm. way and let's players use those words and, and, and learn those concepts. So I, I think like, I think sh having shared vocabulary across a club and across a team is massively underestimated the power of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so Principle four. Uh, yeah, I think you said you had four and cause this is really interesting. I wanted to talk curriculum and game model and vocabulary. Was there one more? Yeah. Except I just froze on it for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that too. Well, while you're yeah. thinking about that, yeah. you know, he, here's a really interesting thing for me in trying to do this. And I've tried to do it multiple times. These things are really hard as well. Yeah. Right. Like you can't walk into some place that doesn't necessarily have a curriculum and say, here's the curriculum because 
the problem is those 15 year olds didn't get what they were supposed to get from nine through 14. Right. 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 And so it's almost like you, you have to start with the, the model or these principles, right? These basic concepts that we're going to teach and guess what? 15 year old, you need to play catch up. So you're working off the same thing that the nines and tens are working on now until they got that. And then, and you're instilling the vocabulary as well. So they get that. And then we can, you know, build a, you know, like I've worked in clubs where someone says, okay, this is the session you're going to run. And I'm like, have you seen my team? Yeah. Right? right. We're not doing that session. Like we are, we're way back here right now. So. Yeah, that's fascinating. So had a really interesting conversation with a coach, an MLS Academy a coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're in an MLS Academy, you get the right to go to the French Federation's course, which everyone says is like spectacular and yeah. incredible and really changes people's view on coaching in a very profound way. So I would love to go. It sounds like it's the best coaching program maybe mm -hmm. out there. But one of the things that he said is he came back and he really, really struggled to implement the methodology from the course because when you ran it with French players, they were so used to their their level of perception was so high, their game knowledge was so high, they'd seen so many matches and understood what they were looking at when they'd seen so many matches because they watched the game constantly and they talked mm -hmm. about it, you know, in the neighborhood with their fathers, et cetera, that um, what was intuitive to them was not intuitive to American players, even very elite technically American players. And so the things that they, that those players figured out in a more, um, you know, a constraints-based environment, you know, the coaches, the French coaches would say, stick it out. You know, they'll, they'll figure it out eventually. And they, the coach would say, I'll come home. And on the third day of like, stick it out though, like they would not. And I had realized I had to invest in background knowledge because, and their capacity to see and send them videos of these things beforehand, because the gap in background knowledge and perception was so pronounced between even technically comparable French players and American players. And it's amazing, right? You go, you go to France, you go to Spain, and you watch the the town club play, and you see this the 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 level of average though is so yeah. much higher than the level of average here. Um, and like you said, because they get to watch high level games, or that's the culture to watch high level games. And so, I mean, I think sometimes the most important first question that we can ask ourselves is right who's in front of me, <laughs> right? Because, yeah. you know, and, and, and what do they need? Because, you know, as, as my friend Chris from Belgium says, right, it's great on paper, it's crap on grass. And, <laughs> and this is the problem, right? Is, yeah. is if we don't know who's in front of us, the most beautiful thing that we learn in coaching course XYZ is going to blow up in our faces. Well, people get very vested in ideas, right? You go to a course, yeah. it's a beautiful, it inspires you. And so now you're like, I believe in this idea. So this idea should always apply. I think one of the most useful phrases in the book is Christian Labor's observation. Mm -hmm. You know, like the answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. It doesn't mean that all answers, to say that the answer depends does not mean that all the answers are equal. Mm -hmm. There's still science. There are still things we know about the things that are likely to work, but they're going to need to be adapted. Mm -hmm. And everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. So... Mm -hmm. You know, I just think that's one of the challenges of the life of a coach, which is there's so little certainty. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conjecture. I'm going to win. I'm going to, you know, from a learning perspective, I'm going to win some games I should have lost and I'm going to lose some games that I should, I should have won. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm never going to get, you know, for sure. I'm going to, I'm going to be playing, you know, the numbers game, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, in the NBA, people score so often, right? you can play great defense and the guy drains the shot. Anyway, the key is just to, is to like, is to play the percentages and to understand where the percentages are and perceive them accurately. Right. If I can make you take the shot with your, you know, step mm -hmm. into your left in the aggregate, in the long game, I'm going to win. And I just think there's a real analogy to that in, in coaching, which is you never really know for sure. You can, um, you're always having to adapt, even a right idea. You're always having to adapt to the setting and the setting is always, always different. You know, you, people say you never, you never receive the same ball twice. You never, co you never coach the yeah. same session twice. Yeah. You never walk in the same river twice, right? You're not right. the same that's man. It's not the same river. Yeah. <laughs> um, There's the original source. Of the <laughs> yeah, quote. It's yeah, the original right. source of the quote, right? But, but see, I think this is important, an important distinction to make. And you, you discuss it at different points is it depends is a great phrase that I 100% agree with. It depends to an, to a point. 
Yes. Because we, there, I think we, I always tell co- like coaches, like, doesn't mean there are no, it doesn't mean there are no hard and fast. And there are no is, is it right. It doesn't mean that anything you do is right. Right. It's always yes. on a scale of effectiveness. And so yeah. if I want to be the most effective, then it depends ends at a certain point on that scale because I can coach a certain way and say, well, it just depends what you want to do. Yeah. But you're being incredibly ineffective with your time. The adaptation and the selection of uh, like it, it, it's a menu of tools. There are tools, right? Yeah. And um, and some tools are better than others. Mm-hmm. So I have to adapt them and have to choose them. And uh, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to try and you know choose a saw to attach a baseboard. It's still mm-hmm. wrong. <laughs> it's still mm-hmm. wrong. Uh, it just means that like how um, the best tool is depends on what I'm trying to accomplish and what yeah. the setting is. I just, it's um, I think it's very easy for, for people to get into these sort of like just relative festival and, you know, any answer is the same as any other. That's definitely not what I'm saying. Yeah. But that context matters Context and matters. purpose matters. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I'm, I think of a activity I was doing in my own practice last night that got me very few of the reps I was hoping to accomplish. Mm. Right. And then, you know, I'm the type of coach that I'll wake up at three in the morning with like, ah, that's how I could redo it, you know? And then I sit there and I write it down by my bed and I wake up in the morning. like, what did I write down last night? Because that didn't work last night, but then I I know I had a brilliant idea at 3am to how I might redo this. Right. And so um, I I think that's great. One of the things um, that I loved Um, I loved and it's something that I've kind of done but you put it so well in there and I think it was also a Christian Lavers thing Um, and I think this is as we're starting to teach more experienced players um, starting an activity the phase before the one you're working on yeah that that is huge so unpack that because I think this is where on the scale of effectiveness, sometimes we run a potentially fantastic practice, but by not doing this, it's way less effective than it could be. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why something might not transfer from practice into the game, which is I haven't prepared players for the complexity of the game. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean I have to start here, right? I want to be clear that I like, I want to build up the complexity of my training environment over time, but the challenge of, executing and you know anything that i'm trying to do sort of tactically i'm trying uh, is exerting order of the chaos of the game and so christian's point was like how does the drill start the drill starts you know we're we're, we're working on um trying to achieve you know uh overloads in the attacking third the drill starts with the coach feeding the ball to the number 10 or the number eight but in the game it starts with the opposition having the ball and you have to win the ball from the opposition. And then everyone, you know, and in, in practice, everyone is already positioned to create width and be and, and in, in the game, when you win the ball, everyone is out of position and two guys aren't even looking at the ball. And the first step is to exert is to just get yourself in the position where you can execute the thing that you want to do. And so the final stages of preparation for this exercise would be like, rather than the coach feeding the ball to the, to, you know, to the number, to the number eight and him feeding the ball and like directing the offense, it would be the coach feeding the ball to the opposition and them having to win it and then be in a terrible position and having to reestablish position and shape over the field and then execute the thing that they want to do, which I think is like, so the rule I kind of derive from Christian's observation is that, you know, in, in the, in the final sequences of any complex practice that, exercise should start in the previous phase of play if you really want to be sure that your players can do it and transfer it yeah i love i mean i love that point and i i i when i read it again in your book i was just thinking of it of like even just in the beginning of my sessions and in smaller rondos right once we get the basic concept then i would start with i'd feed it into the defenders first and like you win it back and now do the concept, win it back. And that, you know, right. And, and this is, I think that one little extra step um, creates the most important phase. Can we get it back, secure it, and then accomplish switching the play, create an overload, whatever you want to do. Shape is the battle, right? Like if I I start with, with my shape exactly how I want it every time, like that's, you know, Mm -hmm. um, it's half the battle. Yeah. And 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 my kids haven't experienced what it means to try, you know, to try and, to try and struggle to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, feedback. 
something you talk about here. And yeah. and this was this is a chapter I, I had a lot of notes in because there's a lots of ways to do this. And I think this is you know, you really relied heavily on your classroom experience here because you know what's a classroom teacher? He's trying to make everyone better. Yeah. So how does he he or she give feedback that's most effective for all? Yeah, and there's I mean is a big chapter. And so I tried to divide it into three chunks just to make it a little bit more digestible. But I think the thing about feedback is it's, it's maybe the most common single thing that we do mm -hmm. in coaching settings. And that's both good and bad, right? Like, so uh, because it's so common, it's familiar to us and we maybe don't give it the attention that we could. Uh, and, um, but it also means that if you could change the quality of your feedback, the effectiveness of your feedback, even slightly because you do it so often, it would have a profound effect mm -hmm. on athletes. Um, and so, you know, a couple of like, so there, like a, there's a 101, a 201, and a 301. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we start with some really basic things that I think are hugely important. And one of them is, um, is being alert to the limits of working memory. And so sometimes in a, let's say we're in a practice and we're working on building out of the back and, you know, I have a stoppage and I stop the players and I tell them, you know, here's some things I want you to think about when you're building out of the back, right? The ball has to be struck at pace. The ball, you know, we have to, we're trying to move the opposition rapidly side to side. The ball has to be fast and it has to be on the ground. And when you receive the ball, you have to open up your hips and your eyes have to be up and you have to be looking for the next option and wide backs. You have to be, you have to press up the field to create opportunity. Right? <laughs> oh, is <Go>. that all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like what, what happens? So the first thing is that like, because we love players and we want them to develop faster, we think that if we tell them more, that seems very logical. If we tell them more, they'll, they'll learn more and they'll get better faster. And it's mm -hmm. in many cases with feedback, it's the opposite. A great, just memorable phrase for this is what a rugby coach said to me, which is if you kept, if you chase five rabbits, you catch none. Mm -hmm. And over and over and over again, we put athletes in the position where we ask them to chase five rabbits, right? Mm -hmm. After I give my players those five pieces of feedback out of, building out of the back what happens mm -hmm. I say go and kids are like I you know it's a blur of things and so they focus mm -hmm. on nothing or they choose mm -hmm. one at random but I can't tell what they're working on so I can't say yes that's much better mm -hmm. <laughs> great job opening up your hips because I don't know what they're trying to do mm -hmm. so I can't I can't tell them whether they're improving and so what happens is we have another stoppage five minutes later where I give them the exact five things again because mm -hmm. we aren't because to really focus, I can really keep one idea in working memory and improve on it at any time. And so mm -hmm. the first thing that I would do much better to do would be to say, pause. The most important thing, or the first important thing to think about when we're building out of the back is the pace of the past. The pace of the past must be fast mm -hmm. so that we move the opposition side to side. Every pass I want to see for the next, next, next minute, I want to see, I want to see crisp, well-struck balls on the ground go. Mm -hmm. Right now my players know what, now they know what they're supposed to be working on. And so mm -hmm. their attention is focused on it. Then two, I can take this idea of like, I can align my stoppage feedback to my live feedback. Like these are the two, the two buckets of feedback are, I can stop everyone and say, here's something I want to tell you, or I can tell players things while they're playing. Stoppage mm -hmm. feedback, live feedback. And often these two things aren't, aren't aligned. So um, if I tell my players, you know, every ball is going to be struck at pace. I want to see fast passes. Then I can be like, yes, Julia, that's what I'm looking for. Harder, Sarah, it's still not fast enough. Like that, mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I'm looking for. That, you, you know, Mm -hmm. ping it into her right and then players know how they're doing and they know whether their passes are fast enough but i'm also as i'm doing this i'm telling them after i make a stoppage when i ask you to do something i will be looking to see whether you do it because it matters to me whether you do it and so many times and, th and that validates the endeavor of feedback mm -hmm. but so many times in practice it's the opposite happens i stop players and i say great girls the ball must be stuck must be struck at pace it must be struck on the ground go Great entry pass, Julia, you know, right. get wider, Car Carly. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. Everything that I'm narrating to my players says to them, as soon as I made that stoppage where I told you to strike the ball fast on the ground, I had forgotten it 10 seconds later. And so you might as well also. So I just think that like we send a message about how much our feedback matters by what we do after it. And that sense of alignment of like, I have to show that, it can, that I'm continuing to think about it if I want players to continue to think about it also. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, like, you see it everywhere. yeah. And I love that because like, I mean, if, if a coach read your book and just read that part and thought, cause we think oftentimes in our practices, how we're going to layer in our progressions of an activity, right. Adding defenders, changing spaces, constraints, whatever it is, but it's just important to layer in our feedback that, you know, okay, what's the most important thing is hitting the ball with pace. We're going to get that 
and then I'll layer in number two. Yes. Right. And then maybe we'll get to number three, but today we got to get one and two. And the whole time I will be telling myself, God, this is so slow. Why don't I tell them? Okay, I, I should tell them five things. About, but you will be faster in the long run, right? Yeah. We'll master playing the ball, hitting the ball yeah. at pace. And we'll say, great. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're really starting to hit the ball at pace. Now I want us to also add, you know, opening up our hips when we receive the ball. Let's yeah. Do, let, right. And, but I'll, I'll master them sequentially as opposed to being on that treadmill of the same five things over and over again, which yeah. oftentimes we, we, we like, we, we, we narrow it back to players. Yeah, I feel like yeah. whatever I tell you goes in one ear and out the other. Well, like maybe that's their problem, and maybe it's because of the way we get feedback. To players. Well, maybe so, it right? just went in one of our ears and out the other as well. Right. And, and or maybe it's because I talk for five minutes, but <laughs> my kids are just like, "Please, can I play now?" Exactly. I always think of you know James Carville, the political correspondent for or consultant for Bill Clinton. You know, Bill Clinton used to go off on all these tangents, and he said, "Bill, yeah. if you make three points, you make none, right? Yeah. So make one." And that's it. And and I I always try to think about that when I speak, when I teach, but also when I wish you'd said that to me at the beginning of this call. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Um, and then the other really uh, crazy thing is that in times of stress, in times of high pressure, when accurate, concise feedback matters most, it's usually when we're the least effective at giving it as well. And that's an art. Yeah, for a variety of reasons. I was, you know, when you were talking about giving one piece of feedback, the battle for self-discipline is mm -hmm. so challenging for a coach, right? There's so many things you know and see that your players don't know and see that the temptation is to try and talk about everything at once. Yeah. Times 10 when you're upset, you know, and you're mm -hmm. frustrated and you're like the pressure is on. And that's the time when you really like, I think one of the most important things you can do is just write down the piece of feedback that you want to give. Mm -hmm yourself accountable for it. I love, I, I love at the end of practice when we ask kids, like, what did we learn today? And, and if they throw out eight things, like we probably haven't done a very good job. <laughs> like I'd love them all to yell out, hit the ball with pace. Thank you. Go home. See you, see you on Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, I think one of the benefits of like, if, if you write down what you say at each stoppage, even if it's just like a, you know, a quick phrase pace, right? Then one, I can look down at my clipboard mm -hmm. and remind myself to stay focused on it. But then I can keep track of like, so what are the things that I, what are the things that I talked about mm -hmm. and how much did I focus on them? If I have over time, if I make eight, eight stoppages, I'll have, you know, eight phrases or I'll have three phrases and I'll have, you know, that I said three times because I really focused on it today. And so I think that can sort of help me. Like there, I, th I think there are a lot of little tricks like that that you can do to, to help, to help you, um, maintain focus. Yeah. And then one, you know, just one other thing that I think like in terms of just emotions that I think, I think there are times for intensity as a coach and to like get intense with players. But I think a lot of times we presume that we make our feedback more powerful when we shout and get emotional with players because it shows our passion for the game or how badly we want them to do it. But I would just observe like many times what we're doing is in, inserting a set of variables that are distractions from the content we want players to listen to, right? Why is he shouting? Because he shouted at everyone equally? How come he never shouts at, you know, he never shouts at, at, at Carlos. Is he mm -hmm. like my dad when he shouts at me? Like, is that, is that like, have I been misunderstood here? All those things are things that potentially could be going through players' heads because I raised my voice at them. When what I want them to think about is play the ball wide there, right? They're distractions from the thing that I wanted to hear. So, so, so I'm not saying don't, be intense there are times for intensity, but interrogate yourself about it. Be intentional about the affect that you bring to any interaction. Because I think we tend to valorize the like moments of intensity of the coach when we're like, yeah. And I'm just not sure that there is value. There. Yeah. And and again, if you if you pick your moment, it will have a, an effect. If every moment is the top yes. of your voice, then it just becomes white noise too. Players get urgency fatigue, right? If everything, if the, if the sky is always falling, yeah. they, 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 they turn, tune you out. Yeah. If everything's fatigue. incredible, nothing's incredible. Like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's so true. And then, I mean, this is the, then the art of coaching is how can I recognize within each of my kids who's going to take feedback, this same exact feedback, same words, yeah. same tone, completely different ways. And if I really want to maximize the potential of both of them, 
I might have to give them feedback a little bit differently. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the art and that's, and that's hard. You're going to screw that up. I screw that up all the time, but it's like, yeah. that's really, that's on me. And so much of how they take feedback is, all, is also a reflection of the larger culture that I've built, mm-hmm. which in some ways is a reflection of like what happens when I give feedback and, um, and do people, do the players believe that my feedback will make them better because they see it making them better. And do mm-hmm. I express my trust in them? Mm-hmm. You know, I talk a lot about, I think one of the things about feedback that's really interesting to think about is that there's a lot of evidence that people learn better and are more motivated by a positive environment, right? Like, and everyone just is happy you should be in a positive, kids should be in a positive environment. Like it's more important than any soccer outcome, right? Just being berated is, um, there's no justification for that. So we know that it should be a positive environment, but people confuse, conflate positivity and praise, and they're actually different things. Mm-hmm. And so the result of that is that because we think that praising someone and being positive are the same thing, coaches get advice like, well, give kids a praise sandwich or praise five times as often as you criticize. Mm-hmm. And so the message there is like, look, if I'm going to make you a great player, I'm going to have to tell you how to do a lot of things differently. If I have to tell you you've done great five times to be able to tell you to play wider there, it's going to be a long road to success. I don't and have time, time for that. <laughs> I don't have time for that. And over time, I'm going to praise you so often that like you, like you said, you're going to tune out my praise and you're going to be like, okay, I get it. Like, like I know that this is disingenuous, which is what happens with the praise sandwich, right? The player mm-hmm. instantly comes to discredit your positive feedback. And that's interesting because praise is also a really powerful way to let a player know what to replicate. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's most powerful tool is like you did that well, keep doing it. So but it's important. So praise is not positivity. And in fact, I, the, the art of coaching to me in many ways is giving constructive feedback in a way that motivates and inspires and shows our faith and trust in players. Right. And so I could do, I could do that by saying someday you're, you know, someday John, you're going to play for the first team. Mm-hmm. And when you get there, you're going to have, you're going to have to receive that ball mm-hmm. first time with your left foot. Mm-hmm. So start now. I want to see you receive it first time with your left foot. Right? Mm-hmm. That's constructive feedback. I'm telling you that I want you to do something differently, that it was insufficient, but I'm also expressing my trust and faith and belief in you. And I'm attaching a why. Yes. Your future self needs this. That's why we're going to start it now. So I'm right. giving well, you a real purpose, a reason for learning this too. And so there are lots of tricks to this notion of like positive framing. And one of them is like framing it in like your aspirations, right? Your future self is worthy of this. Go do it. One of them is challenge. See if you, I know you can do it with your right foot. See if you can do it with your left foot. Mm -hmm. You know, another one is, uh, is assume the best, right? I understand why you, why you wanted to play that ball centrally here. And I love that you're, that you're always trying to go direct to the goal, but here there's a better decision. I want to see you try and go wide, right? That's like, that's, you know, assuming the best about a kid's, about a kid's decision. And so these things are, these are all linguistic tricks, ways that we can give players constructive feedback in a way that reminds them that we believe in them and that motivates them and inspires them. Mm-hmm. And so then we don't have to resort to overpraising in order to create what is a positive coaching environment because yeah. we're doing it in the way that we give constructive feedback. And I just think like that is, um, it's a profound, it's, you know, you talk about like, a, like 1% of you, you do, you know, we'd probably do that a hundred times in the course of a session. If you do it, if you, if you make that tiny change, the course of a year it's a different culture it's a different relationship to learning for student for athletes yeah yeah exactly you know i was reviewing um i coach 13 year old boys in soccer and we filmed our game this weekend and we have this new video tool and it's fantastic and they can watch their own clips and pass change and this and that and they came to training last night they're like wow we we really noticed how many times someone was open we didn't get them the ball right because we, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you know because these four players tried to solve it themselves every time and 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 that was me then going for us to be good here in the future there's got to be 11 of us solving you know making these decisions breaking down these teams not four of you you know they'll take yeah. care they'll wipe out four of you pretty quickly um yeah. and so uh it's interesting so okay so we've created the session um, we, we've, we've got, you know, effective learning environment. We're giving good feedback. How do we know when they've learned? Yeah. <laughs> well, and this is the, this is the core challenge of any teaching session. And, uh, the phrase I think, I think I use there is John Wooden, the mm-hmm. UCLA basketball coach's phrase, like, you know, teaching is knowing the difference between I taught it and they learned it. Mm-hmm. And this is really, really hard. And the first step to it is, is, 
watching carefully, watching forensically, you, know, you might mm-hmm. even say. And this is really challenging because we, pres- we presume that visual perception observation is automatic, that I look at something and I see it, but it's mm-hmm. actually not true. And, you know, like the, the cognitive science on this is fascinating and overwhelming, which is like there can, not only can there be things right before your eyes that you fail to perceive, but it happens to every single training session mm-hmm. that you ask players to do something. And not only do you not notice whether they do it well, mm-hmm. they simply don't do it. And, mm-hmm. you ab- and you, it absolutely never registers with you. Mm-hmm. like something in your blind spot and so the first barrier to understand to like teaching them better is mm-hmm. under is, is absolutely seeing accurately whether players are doing what you ask them to do mm-hmm. and the reason that this happened one of the reasons that this happens is because the degree to which your working memory is highly taxed mm-hmm. affects your perception so a decent example of this would be like you're driving in your car, you get on the phone with your wife and you're on the phone and you're talking about some things she wants you to pick up, pick up the store. And you're like, oh, do you want this kind of noodles or that kind of noodles? Mm-hmm. And so like you're engaged in a conversation that's using your, your working memory. And suddenly you are 10 times more likely to have an accident making a left turn across traffic because mm-hmm. your ability to perceive the rate of an oncoming car has been reduced. Mm-hmm. And so this happens to athletes all the time. Interestingly, when your working memory is full, you perceive less well. And so if I'm shouting directions at you during the match from the sidelines, right. And I'm in your, tr- and my athletes are trying to think about those things. One of the things I'm likely to be doing is degrading their perceptive capacity. Mm-hmm. Also relevant for coaches, which is when I'm trying to think about all the things that I'm trying to think about when I'm coaching, it's really easy for me to not perceive accurately. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that like they, that, uh, cognitive psychologist would say is the best way to reduce inattentional blindness, which is missing things that are in plain sight, is to, is to prepare for them and to, mm-hmm. and to plan in advance for what I want to see. Mm-hmm. And so writing out, you know, if I'm, let's say we're building out of a back, making, building out of a back, making a list for myself, what are the five things that I would see if we were doing this world class that I want to make sure that I watch for? And what are the likely mistakes that we're likely to see? Mm-hmm. If I write those out for myself in advance, I will be more likely to see them. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you know, the, the, this chapter starts with a video of this really brilliant math teacher who's carrying around a clipboard as he's teaching. And the clipboard is because he's, he's treating visual observation as a form of data, mm-hmm. which is to say, if I think that I'm going to walk around and practice when, you know, 18 players are doing rondos and I'm mm-hmm. um, trying to assess their ability to receive the ball first time and, uh, and redirect a touch and to, uh, and to um, see opportunities to split the defenders. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to walk around and do that for 10 minutes and realize what the biggest issue is for my players. You know, I'm going to take mental notes. It's way too much for me holding working memory. And mm-hmm. what I remember will be an accident as opposed to the most important thing. And so this math teacher is just tracking the data. And when he sees the player, make, when he sees a student in his class make a mistake, he ticks it off on his list. And so 10 minutes after 10 minutes of observation, he's got 10 ticks next to in this, in this video. It's like not being able to find, solve for the remainder when they're um, dividing polynomials, right? And so mm-hmm. then he knows what to make his stoppage about because it's based on the data. And so just this notion of like tracking the data when you're observing and having the humility to recognize that um, there's way too much visual information for you to keep in your work, to process in your working memory. You have to write it down. You have to take notes if you want to see accurately. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, as, as you say that, because I have a 15 year old daughter with a learner's permit. Right. And so you go for a drive and, and, you know, the, the experienced driver sees all these signals and right she sees noise right and 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 or her working memory is occupied with um what's my speed and keep looking at the speedometer or whatever and i'm like forget the speedometer look there because your speedometer is not going to cause an accident right now so you just drove through a red light (laughs) (laughs) as you just drove through that stop sign right so so i I think that's like you know it, it is funny you know how we tie these to other things in our lives um and all this together, when we tie all this together, it's really, um, and I was so glad that your book touches on this because sometimes books that go into these really technical aspects forget what I think is most important, which is culture, right? Because culture sets the behaviors, right? And, and the right behaviors repeated over time drives results on the field, off the field, you know, whatever it is. And, and that's what we have to, um, you know, 
really work on. And so you, you list these sort of factors of culture that's got to be intentional. It's shared, it's distinct, it's expressed in habits and language is, is, is common. Um, just give a moment. We've I've had you on a while here, but I think we can't skip culture in this. Yeah, I mean, you can get a lot wrong if you get culture right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, I think it's the thing we remember from the great coaches that you've had. What you remember is the culture mm-hmm. and the way it made you know the mo- one because the most powerful and most motivating human emotion is belonging. Right. Mm-hmm. So the first thing that a culture does is make me feel like I'm in I belong to something and an important part of it. Mm-hmm. But cultures also communicate norms and values and, and they're, um, you know, a lot of this chapter is a long interview with Jesse Marsh, who was so yeah. gracious to spend a ton of time with me. But boy, if there is a coach that is smarter about how do you build a culture, particularly through, I just think his use of language is so sophisticated mm-hmm. in two different ways, right? He's framed the mindsets that he wants his players to have on the field. And he's given them each a, a phrase. And so he's really built this culture through language. So he, you know, he starts by when he gets to New York Red Bulls defining this phrase, um, empty the tank, because mm-hmm. he wants his players to play hard, right? And so instead of like, um, he brings to them this idea, like, what does the phrase empty the tank mean to you, right? Mm-hmm. And so they define it together. And it means like you give it all, even when you think you don't have any more, like for your, for, and so then they start using this word empty the tank to refer to like how they want to play as teammates. Then he also def- defines this kind of these sets of terms for how they want to play tactically. And they, they put the words everywhere and they use the words everywhere. And they, you know, they rate guys in practice on how well they, um, you know, his, you know, his term for like four checking, you know, which is mm-hmm. like, he's taken a hockey term, but described it in soccer and he you know, yeah. defines it into being, and then tries to use the word to build a habit in practice, right? If you think you're going to at halftime of a game, tell guys, you know, I want you to press, I want you to press higher and prevent the, you know, prevent the other guys from being able to turn with the ball. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be able to do that unless they've made a habit of doing it in, in practice. How do you make them do it in practice, right? You right. define it, you give them, you define a word and then you tell them whether they're doing it and, and incentivize they're doing it. Yeah. So um, it's just, there, it's such a sophisticated use of language. Yeah, no, it is. I just saw him he just did a presentation for United yeah. Soccer Coaches Convention and uh, I, I was, I was on right after him and I, so I was watching it. That's a tough he, bill. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's great, man. He was awesome. And uh, it, it was such a cool thing. And I, he had a, a slide up of all their different like language yeah. and, and one of their words, and this is now, you know, he's uh, Red Bull in Salzburg. It is McEnroe. Right. Yeah. And so what does McEnroe mean to you? Like it brings all these, like, it, you can't say McEnroe without emotions and a thought of what does that mean? And, and it's like, that's that common language that, Hey, it's McEnroe, you know, like we just got to, you know, we just got to go for it here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, and what's cool about that, like, so I talk about that in the book, you know, Muhammad Ali and Roger Bannister, those are other terms that like all of his players have and they refer to things. And what's interesting to them is that like they're meaningful to you if, and only if you're in the club. Yeah. And so every time you use the word Mac, the phrase Macro, which means like going for it mm-hmm. when you can play it, say, you know, playing it risky when you can play it safe. So mm-hmm. I think, I think that's what he means by Macro. Yeah, yeah. You're also reaffirming your membership in something because like only some people understand it. And because you understand it, then all of a sudden you're in this, like you're, you're, you have like their language also reminds you of your belonging. Mm-hmm. And so inventing, even if there was a great term that like everyone else in the world used, there'd be a decent argument for like you inventing your own terms mm-hmm. because you, you inventing your own words for something like, look, when we talk about like French culture or Spanish culture, they are defined by the fact that they have their own languages. You have your own language, you have your own culture, mm-hmm. you control it, but you also have a sense of belonging. Just yeah. Really, really yeah. The powerful. all blacks have like great words, you yeah. know, Maori words for different things that it's like, you know, we do, you know, that, and that's culture, right? We do things here that other people don't do, or that's at least great cultures. Um, for sure. Yeah, they, have a, they have a little bit of a fence around them, right. To, to set people off, you know, set people off from the, from the outsiders, which 
builds a sense of belonging. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Last piece here. Um, yeah. and thank you so much for your time. I, I, you know, when I reached out, I'm like, I, I can't just do an hour with you, Doug, there's no way this book is too, too good. Um, you know, you kind of talk on issues in, in growth and development and, and a lot of these challenges. And one of the things that you talk about in there is talent identification, right? Yeah. And, and, and relative age. And um, this idea, and this comes from, I think, you know, Joe Baker from Canada. Um, he's a, you know, sports scientist. And I remember him telling me once, you know, how would you coach if you assume that you got all the selections wrong instead of got them right? Yeah. Right. And, and, yeah. and just let, let's just finish with that because this to me is one of the most important aspects of coaching is this faulty assumption that we got it right at tryouts. Yeah. I mean, you have to select mm -hmm. to do right by player. The players have the right to be in challenging environments and be honored for their effort and to, um, to have challenge. Yeah. To compete with people of a similar level and yeah. focus and motivation. And yeah. So the mistake is not selecting the mistake is making the make mistake is assuming that your selections are, are right. Mm -hmm. And I think the data is overwhelming here that like, we're almost always wrong when we think we see the future. Right. So what, you know, one of the stories is just like, like the number of guys from, you know, this um, really successful U17 national team for England that went to the Euros, you know, and like they, one of the, you know, one of the guys on the team who at this point is like playing in, you know, League Two. Right. It's like we all thought we were going to be in the Premier League. Right. And they all, you know, they're more likely to be working for the electrical company than they are for the utility company. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think they were like World Cup semi finalists, right? And yet the only ones who right. got two national team caps or more was. I mean, Rooney. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's, I mean, you, you could probably talk about some of the applications for how you design club and training when you presume that you're wrong and that movement, that selection has to be fluid and constant. Mm -hmm. And we have to show, we have to believe that the players who are on the B team mm -hmm. will be on the A team. And mm -hmm. the players on the A team uh, will be on the B team, and that the mistake is actually telling kids you're on the A team or the B team, but you should just be on the, you're on the team, and your setting will change depending on what's best for your development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because uh, it's very <laughs> we're blind to the fact that we're almost always going to be wrong about this game. We have to make the guesses, but we have to know that the guesses will be wrong. Right, and we have to coach in a way. We have to coach and give the same resources and attention and and focus to the kids that were in this moment chosen yes. for the B team. Do I have the same vocabulary? Do we do the same drill so that so the kids even could move fluidly from place to place? Do I have a, a curriculum that's consistent so that the kids on the B team are learning the same thing as the kids on the on the A team? Yeah, and you know it's funny. Um, you know, I like I live in Bend, Oregon. We have. Our county now maybe has it's grown a lot here during the pandemic, <laughs> but like uh, you know, uh, maybe one hundred fifty thousand people, right? Yeah. And then it's two and a half hours before you get anywhere else. Yeah. So when we build a soccer club, like those kids that we have, that's it, right? You're not recruiting from the neighboring town. There's no one else, right? So you have to do it. And so, like to get to your point, like when I got back to coaching, I said I'll coach but I want the whole age group, right? Yeah. I, I want the A and the B team. Um, they're going to get the same experience. We're not going to have the parents panic that my kid got the B team and now they're shuttled over to the corner. My kids have free flow of movement that they can come to the A team practice. In the summers when kids are coming and going and camping, we train together. Um, and, and so there's this, rather than like this cliff that you fall off at the end of the A team, it's just a gradual decline. And now yeah. that B team kid who made it because he's born in December, he's a late bloomer, all of a sudden grows and blossoms. He just seamlessly slides into the next team. And, and what we know about attrition in, in youth sports is that if we want a team of, if, if we still want a team of 18 year olds in my club, we better have two teams of 12 year olds because we're going to lose kids. And yeah. when we need to fill the spots of the kids who leave, the kids who fill those spots have to be on the same program. And, yeah. it, and, and, and so like for me, th this is huge. And you write in the book, 
like one of the first things that I do, and it was funny, I was chuckling when I, I actually read this this morning, you said, um, you know, get some of those A team kids to guest play on the B team right off the bat. So yeah. it's this like, it's not like a demotion, right? It's like, oh, sweet. We're have just the best team. kids, have the best kids play down, right? And then yeah. it's clear, like as soon as you make the best kids do it, then you're like, hey, how come, how come Caleb's playing down? Yeah, yeah. You can get some extra touches. You can have the chance to, and some kids will be coming up, right? Yeah. yeah. It's just minutes, right? I do this on the weekends. It's like, hey, I have yeah. this roster and I want to get you as many minutes as possible. So I'm going to try to give you 20 with this team and yeah. 50 with this team. And it's also fascinating because you really don't know, like you could have a kid on the B team who um, you put him in an A team situation where players are moving differently off the ball and are actually getting him the ball for his runs. And suddenly he's a different player mm -hmm. and actually, um, you know, could be a, a much higher performing player if you put him in a different <laughs> setting, just as like you bring your A kid down and you think he's going to dominate the B team. And actually he doesn't because it yeah. turns out that he relies on great players around him. There's just a lot to be, yeah. there's a lot yeah. to be learned about players from changing their environment. And so like, it, it's, it's also kind of like a data, like a, a, a an understanding and data opportunity. And then it's the character about. piece, go make them better, right? Yeah. If you're really good, you should make the people around you better. How can you be a better teammate in this situation? Right, and go learn how to make them better, not by being a jerk and shouting at them and acting like I'm the A team kid on the B team, but like by going and making them better by like making better passes and yeah. moving and supporting them. And, um, and the, you know, those experiences are in the long run gonna be more profound and more important than anything that happens in the soccer field. Yeah. It's how do I, how do, how do I make, pe how do I walk into a different situation and make people better in a way that shows like my humility and my high expectations at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's so funny when you tell that story. I, I I think back, this is going back, you know, almost 20 years now. I was living in Michigan and I was coaching a, a high school age boys team. And someone mentioned to me that out, you know, you know, out in the middle of nowhere rural school, there was a kid, an exchange student. Um, and he's pretty good, but you know, whatever. He dribbled too much. He lost the ball and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, okay, whatever. And they're like, yeah, you know, you don't want them. And so I went and invited him to <laughs> practice and I watched for 10 minutes now surrounded. Oh my, like, God. oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, Ollie, where are you from, man? He's like, Oh, I, you know, I played for Atletico Madrid. I'm like, there you go. Right. <laughs> he, he played on the same youth team as Fernando Torres. Right. And, 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 right. and, and here he was in rural Michigan, just doing an exchange year surrounded by kids who don't play. And so he's just having fun trying to nutmeg people. You know, and I'm like, and just, oh my God, just missed it. No one thought he was think, good. But think about that for a minute because it tells you how profoundly the quality of the playing environment influences mm -hmm. what any kid can do. And it just like, there are hundreds of kids, thousands of kids out there right now who are domestic versions of that, who have been miss, missed or written off because the playing environment is, um, it's, it doesn't right. look like the game is, it's, it's not right. Like they yeah. don't respect like this. I, this is like my brain. Like the first thing you want is, is a club and a coach who respect the game and want to teach the game. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, they're not playing there. You know, you have a great player, but he's in a club or a team where they're trying to play route one soccer and they're playing right over the top. And he's trying to he like open up for the ball and play, you know, and mm -hmm. create space and no one's giving him the ball. Like, there are hundreds and thousands of kids out there who are living that life right now. And, and, the coach and the, and the other parents are like, why are you playing the ball backwards? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't play it backwards. Or, or they um, yell like oh, <laughs> him. He's the ball hog. Right. I'm like, well, what I see is he's looking to play a pass and no one's in that space. Like he yeah. he's light years ahead of your kids <laughs> right now. Right. Um, and yeah, no, it's, it's, it's amazing, man. Well, I mean, Doug, this was, this was awesome. We covered so much ground and I really truly appreciate your time. And um, we, we could, like I said, I mean, we could go, we could do an hour on each chapter and not even scratch the surface. I, I cannot recommend your book highly enough. The coach's guide to teaching. We're going to put all the links and stuff in the, in the show notes, but I, I want to give you the last word. I want to know, you know, how can people connect with you and then maybe a final thought or two here? Yeah. Great. Thank you. So for just thanks for this opportunity. I really enjoyed it. And I love talking about the game and teaching the game and developing uh, developing kids and i'm just i'm grateful for not just this opportunity but for the work that you do informing coaches it's really important 
Um, if coaches want, you know, the book is Coach's Guide to Teaching. Uh, hopefully you buy it at your local bookseller, but if you can't, you can get it on Amazon. Hmm. Um, I have a blog. It's teach like a champion, uh, back, dot com backslash blog. And I, I write about teaching and coaching there. Um, and you can also follow me on, on social media where I'm, I'm Doug Lamov, L-E-M-O-P. Um, and so, you know, I love learning from coaches and hope that, that folks will be in touch. And I, I guess if I had well, one last thing to say, it would just be thank you um, mm-hmm. to coaches. Like it's uh, it's such a profound and important experience in, uh, in, uh, in so many kids' lives. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 hard, it's hard work. It's hard to do it well. Uh, and so, but there are so many coaches who put their heart and soul into it and really are attentive to, uh, to how to grow and develop kids. And it has, a, it does have a profound influence. So um, there are many, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, who do great work and, and uh, I just want to express my appreciation to them for everything they do on behalf of young people. Mm, love it. Well, Doug, thank you so much. You're, we're recording this at a time you're living in upstate New York. You probably have some snow to shovel. So Got a little bit of snow out there. That's for sure. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for your time. We'll put all everything in there and, and thanks for the work that you do in, in the sport that I love, but also for all coaches everywhere. I, again, the book is fantastic. Uh, it should be on everyone's nightstand. Um, don't think that you're going to read this and put it all into practice. It's kind of one of those you want to drip feed into the work that you do, but uh so much great stuff. And I uh, just, thanks for being on the way champions again. Thanks, John.